Oh, you wanted a big one? Well, they don't get much bigger than this. He has won three MLF Cups, a Bass Pro Tour event, 25 Bassmaster events, seven Bassmaster Angler of the Year titles, four Bassmaster Classic victories, over $7 million in earnings, and he won a freaking ESPY. He is the one and only KVD, Kevin Van Dam. This week on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all, friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. Hope you're all having a good week. Happy hump day to each and every one of you. I hope... uh, This little podcast helps you pass the time, whether you're stuck in traffic, whether you're lined up uh, to get that hard-to-get Christmas gift. Hopefully this helps pass the time, because this is the number one rated fishing podcast on this entire channel, and I appreciate you all for listening week after week, and this week is a special one, Um, a very, very special one. For several reasons. I mean, we have the biggest name in the industry. Um, Whether you want to refer to him as the Wayne Gretzky of our sport, the Tom Brady of our sport, whatever you want to refer to him as, that's what Kevin Van Dam is. I mean, um, on top of all that, for me personally, he's one of my best friends on this entire planet. I love this man. I love his entire family. And... um, I've been excited to do this podcast for a while. And to prove just what a big deal he is, I'm just noticing this right now. But if you look over my shoulder right there, KVD is the only guest we've ever had that has his own bobblehead in the bobblehead collection. So um, very, very big deal. If you're listening to the audio version, come on over to YouTube and check it out. And you can see Kevin's um, bobblehead. Or the real Kevin, who's going to be coming up in a few minutes. And that's exactly what I am excited about this podcast. Because me and Kevin have talked about it for a while, but I'm I'm just like, well, we need to have a real conversation. And, and in this uh, podcast, I see Kevin open up and talk about things that myself personally, I, I've never heard him talk about publicly. And... Um, should be a good one, and and I really enjoyed it, and I hope you do too. Without further ado, the greatest angler in the history of this sport, the winningest pro to ever play the game, the one and only Kevin Van Dam, all the way to Kalamazoo, Michigan, and the one and only Kevin Van Dam. KVD, how are you? Dave, I am doing great, man. It's a, it's a shame that we're not together in person actually but this is the next best thing yeah yeah it, worse because i know that room i know what's on the other side you're directly <laughs> looking at one of my favorite parts of your house which happens to be the bar our cocktail lounge whatever you want to refer to it as how's the festive season what what is festive season like for kvd um you know it's been busy uh Gosh, you know, anymore, there's no off season. And and honestly, October, November, and December get really even crazy. But it's, we really try to um, shut it down about mid-December till through Christmas. You know, it, our family's gotten a lot bigger with all my nieces and nephews getting older. And now they're having kids. And, you know, Jackson's in Nashville now. so But he's coming home for Christmas. And Nicholas is still here and um, just like I say, everything is, uh, it just seems to get more crammed in and, uh, but uh, you know, the holiday season is something my wife is, you know, Sherry is super festive, right? So the Christmas lights, the decorations and, and all the planning for having our families to get together and that, and again, as we get bigger, that means more days. So it's a lot of fun. I, I look forward to it. We have a lot of food, fun. Uh, a few cocktails for sure and just a lot of you know it's a great time to kind of chill through you know the first of the year and then it's I mean it's we hit the ground running 
Yeah. What 30th anniversary this week? Did you do anything to celebrate you and Sherry? We just we had a nice um dinner at home. Um we made a quick trip to Chicago right before it to just, you know, uh, the holiday season in New York or Chicago. It's just it's great to see all the decorations and lights and things like that. And she loves to shop, you know. I mean, I've been on several hunting trips and things like that, so I've I've got to do that. And we're we're going to do something special. Um, it's just not a good time. It's so busy with the holidays and that right now would be a bad time for us to take a, a, a trip, you know, to celebrate for ourselves. But it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. It doesn't seem like 30. And we've been together no. for 35 years. And, you know, she's, you know, as you know, she's an amazing part of the reason I am who I am and very important part of um, our brand and our business. But she doesn't like to be in the limelight at all. Like she doesn't want to be on camera. She doesn't like to, she doesn't like take any credit for anything. But she's always there behind the scenes. I mean, we just finished up our holiday giveaways on our social, and that's all her. I mean, she does an amazing job on that, and and people really like. Of course, who doesn't like free stuff, right? But um, it it goes real well, and it's she's just a very giving person. Does a lot for a lot of other people. And that's one of the things I love about her is how, how much she cares to make things special for other people, to do things for other people, to help out other organizations, other charities. Um, you know, we, we do a lot with our foundation, but, um, and she's, you know, she's the driver of all of that. There would be no KVD without SVD. She's a, <laughs> yeah. an amazing. Well, we, we, yeah, we all, it's the, it's very similar, you know, the, you know, Zona, and you and I are very similar in a lot of ways. And yeah. our wives are very engaged in, in all three of our businesses and lives. And, you know, it's, it's, it's great to, uh, it, that's why it works, you know, because they are such, such an involved, engaged uh, part of, of what we do. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You mentioned your brand. So I want to get right into that because, I mean, I would say in pro fishing, you're by far the most, and I know you're going to be like, no, 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 but you're the most uh, pronounced brand, most epic, like to ever the KVD. What, was that a Tim, Tim Tucker thing? That wasn't <laughs> yeah, something you, you know, it's up funny. With, I it? never, um, and you look at it now and how many people are, you know, yeah. they just use I was, I think the first, and it wasn't me, it wasn't my idea, but it was, no, that was Tim Tucker that actually did that. And it just kind of stuck. I mean, it worked, it's worked through the media and, and it's where it all started. And then since then, you know, you look at a lot of other anglers, it's have, have copied that, which, you know, obviously it, it for good reason. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very cool. And it, it I mean, there's people that it's weird. I, I see people and how they interact with you. At times, people don't even refer to you as a person anymore. You become, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, yeah. it's, oh, it's, I, I, it's very, it's flattering and humbling to me. Um, you know, I mean, it's something that we've worked hard at. Again, uh, that's a big thing that Sherry's involved, engaged in is, you know, our brand, our, my image, um, you know, I mean, just everything from the, you know, I've always wore black pants or black shorts and our color scheme and logo and all, all of those things. I mean, it's not by accident um, that we've grown it to this. Obviously, having a lot of success on on tour over the years is a, is a big reason. And it took it took a while, um, you know, to to get there. But without a doubt, those ESPN years when ESPN owned Bass and um, you know, I won a lot of Angler of the Year titles then and, and classics during that time period. And it just brought the sport to the mainstream sports fan. And, um, you know, a lot of people don't give them that credit. But ESPN was the greatest thing that ever happened to bass fishing, I think. And I'm I'm a, one of the benefactors for sure of that of that era. Totally agree. I totally agree. Do you remember the first time you ever heard the KVD term? Like, and if you do remember that, did you ever imagine that it would literally dominate aisles in a yeah. Bass Pro Shops? <laughs> um, you know, it 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 was Tim Tucker, and it was it, it was when it really took was at one of the press conferences at the Classic. 
you know, after a day on the water, and, you know, he'd say it. And then, you know, some of the other writers that were there, they picked up on it. And that's where, you know, I mean, as far as uh, media, then, you know, newspapers back in the day in the early days were a big part of it. So having uh, a headline KVD instead of Kevin Mendes, you know, so that's really where it kind of uh, grew and spawned and, and blossomed from. And then we just kind of, you know, I, I didn't ask for it, but it was handed to me. So we just kind of rolled with it. And, and today it's, you know, it's, it, it's pretty cool that kids come up to you and, and they do, they, they don't call me Kevin. They it's like KVD, you know, and, you know, just anywhere I go up and down the road or gas stations or in, you know, in the mall or on vacation or anything like that, people, you know, you, you see them do that double take and that. So it's, it's, it's really, uh, it's pretty special for sure. One of the most special things in our sport, and I don't think anyone ever really talks about it. Like I think anglers know it, but is those relationships like the relationship you had with Tim Tucker, the relationship you have with Louis Stout, the relationship you have with, you know, countless outdoor writers. How important has that been in your career? Well, you know, media has changed exponentially. Um, but back in the day, that's what it was. It, it was really working with those uh, local outdoor writers, regional outdoor writers. And, you know, Ray Scott was so smart in the very beginning to, to get all those guys that they're not just Ray, but Bob Cobb and Ray yeah. both, you know, I mean, they planned that out. They would invite uh, these people. And, you know, those early classics for me, that's the focal point was that the media that was there, there wasn't, it wasn't about, I mean, there was TV, but back then the shows were, you know, the classic would be on a month later, you know, yeah. I mean, it, the, till it was on TV. Now everything's live and, you know, there's social media and uh, it, it's just that that world has changed, but those relationships were really, really important. You know, my local sports writer um, that I, uh, first started with was definitely Louis Stout and Bob Gwiz. Those guys were both from this region. And, uh, you know, Bob worked for the Booth Papers, which was all of the major ones around Michi all the Michigan different cities and that. And we would go out on a fishing trip, take some pictures and that. And he'd do, you know, do a piece on there. And, and Louis was the same way. You know, I mean, we did stuff, um, you know, he was in the kind of the South Bend area and we would do that stuff. And then also, it would end up in, you know, Bassmaster magazine. So, and Bob would write some stuff for Bassmaster. So it's just, uh, you know, all of those, all of those days, um, you know, the in fisherman, Bassmaster, um, you know, Bass Times, uh, Bass and all, all of those magazines. And then really these, these regional papers and having the classics move around to different areas, even yeah. though, you know, it took me a while to win one. Um, I was still usually you know, one of the favorites going in or whatever. So I'd get a lot of media and that, that really helped start that fan base for sure. But it, it was the next era that really um, changed it. You know, I think I just feel lucky. It's funny. I, Davey and I were, we were down at Whoville ranch um, with Zona and, and Combs and Hank chair, you know, all of our, our fishing group down there and, and, and Tom. And I mean, we had this conversation about the, we just feel like, you know, the greatest era in professional bass fishing, we got to be a part of. And it is when we were kind of both in our prime and really, um, you know, when Davey won the classic and yeah. angled years through that, that that time. And again, the ESPN, that time frame, it just really, um, it, it, it was just a fun time to be a part of. And now, um, not that it's not even better because I mean, the, the coverage and the live streaming and I mean, you can't hide anything anymore. It's just, um, and with social media and that it's, it's still, I mean, it's a tremendous time as well, but that was, I mean, those were the, to me, the glory days. Yeah. Well, one of your, your commitments is to media, it blows me away. And I don't know if I <clears throat> ever told you this story, but as busy as you are, and I've always been like, I, every time I spend time with you, I'm like, oh, you are an idiot. You need to get better at stuff because I remember being at your house for one Thanksgiving and getting a text from an outdoor writer and being like, Hey, can, can we do a quick interview together? And I said, I'm away. I responded away with my family right now. I will let's talk on Monday. And I thought, Hey, you responded. You're being doing your job. 
the next morning I came up the stairs and you were on the phone with somebody. I had no idea. And then when you got off, it was the exact same outdoor writer that I told I was away with my family. So I realized <laughs> KVD might be better at this than me. Um, but social media positive or a benefit in the way like you went from a part of this industry where literally all you had to do talk to outdoor writers and now literally you're talking to situations like this you know you know what i mean like it yeah. it is a it used to be like a weekly occurrence where people did you'd post weekly now it's daily hour like depending on who you are i mean it it's non freaking stop yeah social media is uh it's a very powerful tool, a very important tool. Um, sponsors definitely uh, demand it for for sure. And I'm different than some. I mean, like some guys, they are, they're posting 17 times a day. I, I'm not that that way. We we you know we do it on a much more scaled back, but more. Um, yeah, I mean, it's important to blend a little bit of your lifestyle along with things where you're talking about a new product for a sponsor and that, cause you know how it is. You, um, you know, you post, uh, about this, a new bait today and a new electronics tomorrow. And that's people like, Oh, all you're trying to do is you're always just trying to sell something. Well, that's, it's part of my job for sure, but it's also, there's a lot of people that follow us that they want to know, you know, yeah. what, uh, the key settings are for mega live, right. For instance, or, you know, I mean, um, how you have your, your boat set up and that, you know, one of the most popular things that I do is that my boat walk around video each year, you know, and just going through and seeing how I have it set up, how I have things placed, how you have your electronics rigged and wired and, um, your battery system, lithiums. And, you know, I mean, it's people want to, you know, a lot of people want to know that. And so social media is a great platform to do that. Also, you know, obviously YouTube channels and, we, you know, we do a lot of live stuff. We do, you're doing podcasts like, like that. I do quite a few of them now as well. And it's, uh, it's just such a critical way. I mean, back in the day, what I looked forward to every Sunday was, you know, the TNN days yeah. of watching that block of, of fishing shows, right? Now you can watch whatever you want, when you want, you know, you my outdoor TV, you can go back and look at every past episode of you know your show or zona show or you know bass masters or uh major league fishing anything you want to see when you want to see it and then and same thing and now with all these streaming services i mean you can find anything you want and you and you can the other cool thing that i love about um social media and youtube is that you can literally find a video on how to do anything. So for a beginner or somebody, there's no, uh, you know, I think people used to be afraid to go into a place like DNR sports and say, Hey, how do you tie a knot? Or how do you rig a Texas rig worm or some of these basic things? Now you can learn how to tie an FG knot 67 ways with a YouTube video and Texas rig a worm or, or advanced drop shot techniques, or, you know, watch 4,600,000 videos, you know, from me in the past, from tournaments or, or fishing or, you know, old Bass Pro Outdoor World shows or anything like that. So it's to be able to find all that media. That's the that's what is really awesome about the technology and, and where we're at today. You mentioned DNR and we had a guest a few weeks ago, Larry Nixon, that told a story about <laughs> DNR and meeting a young KVD and um I'm assuming you've seen the story by now. And if you haven't, please don't embarrass me by saying you don't watch it and uh, tell me you did. Well, so this has came up multiple times with Larry Nixon over the years, you know. Um, so my saying would be, and, and, you know, God love Larry, but, you know, you, you why would you let the truth get in the way of a good story, right? So the truth <laughs> of that scenario was, um, you know, when I first started fishing, you know, we our store my brother's store dnr sports it it's a you've been there multiple yeah. times you've done the spring show there is always i mean it's for an independent retailer marine dealer like that it's a it's an awesome weekend right and it's great for the fans it's great deals on products um you bring in a lot of pros and do seminars and early on i mean he's been he's been doing it you know for whatever 40 something years now so it's it's really built into a big deal so early on 
you know, getting some of the top pros was not necessarily super easy, but, um, you know, through tracker, you know, Larry was on the nitro team and Tommy Martin, we, we got some of those guys to come. And when I first started fishing, I just, you know, I just was enamored with, with all of them, you know, with, with Larry, um, with Rick Klon, with Danny Brower, with Guido Hibden, with Hank Parker, Roland Martin. I mean, I wrote a term paper in high school on Roland Martin's 101 best catching secrets and, and got an A plus. And, you know, it's because I was interested in fishing and, you know, it worked out. And I told Roland that story and he, he got a big kick out of it, you know, but I mean, I just watched those guys on, on TV and grew up watching them and reading them and about them in Bassmaster magazine. And I just wanted to see just how good they were. So we had Larry Nixon scheduled to come to the in-store promotion and I was so nervous. I couldn't even talk to him. I couldn't approach him. I couldn't, I couldn't go up to him and say, hi, introduce myself. I was freaked out so bad that Larry Nixon was there. I mean, I just, he was Mr. Megabucks, right? I mean, yeah. he won all, he's just an incredible fisherman. Um, you know, Rick Klon was the godfather of pattern fishing and power fishing and things like that. But Larry Nixon to me was the most versatile, best uh angler just everywhere he went and just you know really good at finding fish quick and things like that and i just i, I was just like he was like a let a god to me you know and so when he came to the store i couldn't even talk to him so throughout the day you know i'm running around i'm you know i was working then selling boats and tackle and doing all the things that i had and these guys do their seminars and my old uh my team partner don stevens who he grew up fishing with me and my brother a lot, taught me a lot. And we fished a lot of stuff together, started fishing BASS together. And he walked up to Larry and he's the one that told him, he said, Hey, see this kid right here. He's going to be, he's going to kick your, he's going to be kicking your asses in the future. His exact <laughs> words. And, and Larry turned that around and says that I said that, I don't know how that got changed. I mean, he is getting pretty old, um, you know, it, it, and your memory starts to go a little bit. But like I said before, why let the truth get in the way of a good story? So he, he has told that story multiple times to me, around me, to people that, that I'm with. And uh, it's embarrassing to me to this day because I'm not I was very confident, but I was not no way would would I ever have dreamed. I, I couldn't even talk to him. You know, I was shake. I was sweating and shaking when I when I at that moment when I find that was the. The first time that I actually spoke to Larry that weekend when he came to the store was when Don made that introduction. He, I was too nervous to introduce me. That's how Don introduced me to him. Wow, wow, it, that's the real story. Larry's story is cooler, Kevin. I gotta yeah, be honest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very Tom Brady esque when he told Robert Kraft, "I'm the best decision this franchise has ever made." And um, so the truth. I like both stories. The truth is always kind of just a little less. Yeah. Exciting. <laughs> it does, the truth doesn't usually make it near as good a story, but uh, it, that's, that's how it went down. So riddle me this young growing up, like were you, what age did you decide in your head? Like when was the first time you said, man, this is what I, I want to do. Well, I learned pretty early on that tournament fishing was something that I really liked and enjoyed. You know, I fished my first tournament when I was 14 with my older brother. It was a team tournament and we ended up finishing second. And during that uh, time, it was an October tournament at a little local lake called Pine Lake, real close to where I live. And I caught most of the bass. I really caught all the bass. That And, and the funny part of this is Don Stevens, who was I originally, after that, I started fishing tournaments with him and his partner won the tournament and they won it by like, they had like 19 pounds and my brother and I, we had like 14, almost 15 pounds for four fish. Um, it was a cold October tournament. I caught him on a black and blue jig with pork. Remember the uncle Josh pork. And my brother caught one little 12 inch keeper and I caught three big ones. And we had like right at 15 pounds. And cause I caught the fish that, that won the money. I thought I should get all the money. And my brother paid for the gas, the entry <laughs> fee, everything. And um, and he had to go over and he's like, hey, Don, you got to tell Kevin then team tournaments, this is how this works. So that's how I met Don Stevens was, was uh, there at that tournament. After that, you know, Don and I started fishing together. By the time I turned 16, I joined a bass club here in Kalamazoo, Cal Valley Bass Club. And I won Angler of the Year in our club the first year as a non-boater and was a boater the second year. And, uh, and again, the start of the federation. And, 
I just, when I was 18, I just like, man, I, that's, you had to be 18 to fish the Bassmaster Opens. And back then it was the Opens or the Invitationals, they were called six Invitationals. And that's when the BP Top 100 started. So Angler of the Year was six Invitationals combined with the the four BP Top 100s. And the, the top performer after the season was there, was your AOI. So my first year full time was, you know, a couple of years. I fished a couple of tournaments. I fished one when I was 18 at Thousand Islands in New York, learned a hard lesson, drawn out. I drew out with Ron Shear and I let him talk me out of I had a great pattern right across from Clayton, throwing a, a lipless crankbait on a on a flat there, catching, I was catching like 13, 14 pounds of smallmouth a day practice there. And we made this giant long run because he's like, oh, we catch a four pounder every cast where I'm going to go, you know, and he was making the long run to the power plant, the other side of Henderson Bay and fishing the discharge. And back then we didn't have the weather forecasting. And my gosh, we were out there in an 18 foot ranger and it was like eight to 10 footers. And we never made it down there. We tore all the de- electronics and troll the motor off. We floated around a little in Shimo Bay, each caught one keeper and the next two days, I came back to my fish right there across the way in a nice pr- little protected bay and caught 13, you know, caught a, caught a good sack each day. And Ken Cook ended up winning the tournament with less than 45 pounds. So I was like, dang, you know, I could have won my first tournament, but it would have probably been bad to uh, to do that. So I learned a good lesson, you know, then about how to. Why, handle... why would it have been bad? Because you don't want to, you, you know, you have to. I think if you go in and you and just have that kind of success right out the gate, you you don't learn to appreciate what it takes, you know. And what I say, what I what I learned is not to be intimidated by the best of the best out there. I mean that Rick Lon or or Larry Nixon, if you get paired with those, and I'm sure lots of people back then, because it was pro on pro, you stand in the front deck, you flip for your boat, whatever. Um, go spend half the time on each other's fish, whatever it was. So I learned real quick how to manage that, not get intimidated. And, um, you know, the first year I, you know, I, uh, when I started full time, you know, I, I finished third in my first tournament at thousand islands. It was the first kickoff of the season. And, um, a lot of those guys didn't really give me much respect because I ended up uh, fishing with Dave Fenton, who was, he was in third place going the last day. I was in like 12th, I, you know, or, you know, t- or ninth or something like that. I was close to the top 10 and I was fishing the lake and it was supposed to blow. So I went with him to his fish in Lake of the Isles and he was flipping jigs and he just got real nervous and was fishing too fast. And I caught him behind him, you know, and it's like some of these, like Guido Hibden ended up winning that tournament. But, um, a lot of these guys, uh, thought it, you know, I was, I was doing, or no, Dusty Pine won that tournament. The rat. Come on. <laughs> the, dude, that is one of my most, me- like that's well, the one greatest of the greatest Bassmaster shows I've ever. Heard. Yeah. Dusty Pine on the rat. Yeah. That, yeah. But anyways, um, so I finished third there and, and, um, you know, we fished a few other tournaments and I ended up finishing almost one Guido Hibden won the St. John's, uh, river. And I finished second there in Rodman and sh- I, man, I should have won that one too, but, you know, had a really good year and finished first in the points and then qualified for the top 100. So, you know, that first year I was rookie of the year. The next year I won angler of the year. Um, you know, my first full seat, first qualifying season that I could um, on on tour and won it, you know, I won a tournament at Lake Lanier, that top 100 there in December, right before Sherry and I got married. So it was, you know, uh, that was a big, that was a big deal, you know, to, to have a good start like that to my career. And then, you know, those guys really, uh, cause I was running a nitro part of the Bass Pro team, you know, Larry and Tommy really took me under their wing and helped me out a lot. Denny Brower is another, you know, Denny and Shirley were great friends uh, of, of ours and Sherry's. And those guys taught me so many things, not about fishing, but about what it's, what it's like to be a pro. Um, the business side of it and and more importantly than anything how to you know how to compete out there um you know respect the people that you're 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 fishing against and really denny taught me more than anything i mean starting out i I had a record i think 23 tournaments in a row uh in the money but you know and i won that one at lanier but i really was so focused on making sure that i got a check that i didn't take those chances so hanging around denny 
uh, and, and seeing how he did things. And, you know, he would go for broke on that third day just to have a chance. And I've seen him win a few tournaments. And so he really taught me what you what you have to do to win. Right. The mentality, the mental aspect, uh, because and in, in still today, the most valuable asset any pro angler has is is right there what's between your ears that's the difference because everybody's great now like they all have unbelievable electronics uh mapping you know in, you know you can you can do all kinds of research and google earth and um everybody's good at every technique you know they've got all the tools and equipment what separates the best anglers in the world now is still the same thing that it did then it's just that the the competition has gotten a lot closer but it's it's all about those decisions and on the water and knowing when to do what and and to make those adjustments and change and you know you you hear people say that all the time it's like well you know i'm i'm gonna go for broke i'm gonna swing for the fence today well i can look at somebody i, I and i'm not gonna name names but i bet you know i've seen that so many times the final day of the classic um you know the final day of a lot of different tournaments, you know, where somebody's a little bit behind or, or even if they're in the lead, I can see it in their eyes that they don't believe their own words, you know, and the guys that do that have that laser focus and are burning, you know, burning a hole through you. That's the ones you watch out for. You, you say Brower did a lot to teach you that. Did, do you, did you not show up with a certain level of confidence? Like, like, Oh, for sure. I mean, you had to like, because when I look at back at the first time I ever heard your name, and I don't think I've ever told you this, but the first time I ever heard the name Kevin Van Dam was from two Michigan dudes who used to come to Ontario and fish tournaments, Bill Robinette and EB Smiley. And I remember <laughs> they said, they said, Oh, there's this kid um, from Michigan and he's going to win everything. And, uh, and I remember thinking like, a kid from Michigan, like there's no, at that time, there was honestly very, very few people from the North at all that fish tournaments. Was it, did you have to overcome a lot? I mean, I'm sure that everybody didn't roll out the red carpet and welcome you. Yeah. Right away. Did no, they? I, I actually got a lot of pushback from some of the, from the Southern pros and some, and some of the old timers for sure in the beginning, but nobody told me I wasn't supposed to win. Right. I believe and I, I came in with that kind of confidence. And, you know, it's interesting in talking with Rick Clund years later, because um, early on when I won my first Angler of the Year title, it was him and I battling down to the end. And he expected me to fold, you know, and yeah. Lake Norman. And, um, you know, I really had a really good event, um, you know, there and, and one Angler of the Year walking away. And, you know, he didn't want to really talk to me or anything, which I respect him for that during it. Cause he's like, he didn't want to try and intimidate me to, uh, to try to beat, to beat me out of winning angler of the year that year. And that was 92. And, you know, after the fact, you know, him talking to me, he's like, you know, you just, you have that youthful enthusiasm. And a lot of people thought that I was cocky or arrogant and maybe, maybe I was, but it was not intentional it was just i i had a lot of confidence but when i say denny taught me how to win i'm just watching how he did things and his decision making process and that it changed my mentality of how i approached those tournaments when you were in position you know when you when you had an opportunity to to get close and and obviously once you've won once then you know what it feels like and you know what it what it takes and um you just it, it goes in, it goes in streaks, you know. I've been fortunate to win a bunch over the years, and I can tell you this is that every single time it's more special than the time before. You know, I mean, my, the last tournament I won was a, a Bass Pro Tour event at Chickamauga, and it'd been a few years, you know. And I, I just I know how hard it is to put yourself in that position, and I mean, it meant I, you know I I definitely shed some tears on camera on that final day when it was, when it was going down, because I know how special that is. And it's the same thing a few years prior to that Remember, I hadn't won in a while. And everybody's like, what's, what's KVD's won his last event. He's, he's washed up or whatever. And then, you know, I won, um, you know, Toledo band and Iuga and, you know, I mean, I won knocked off three in a row or three in pretty short order. It just don't, you can't plan it, you know, and it's, it's so special. And I've watched that so many times over the years. I remember, 
the year that David Fritz won Angler of the Year. I remember the first year that Davey Height won Angler of the Year, where you, where you just you're in a zone and the schedule lines up to fit your style, and you see these guys get on these amazing runs. You can, um, it, and you can see it with you know Polinick this year. To I mean, it's almost every single year. Um, I watched you know a few years back, Brent Chapman won Angler of the Year. Yeah. I mean, just Saint Saint without fail. You see guys come out of nowhere and and just get in their own. And again, a lot of it's it's timing, it's confidence, it's schedule all rolled into one. I wish you could plan it out because it'd be, yeah. it'd be but you can't, you know, it's just, but I've, it's been fascinating over my career, which, you know, I've been doing this 32 years now professionally to see that. And it, it still is special, you know, and, and I am for sure a student and a fan of the sport still to this day. And um, it's crazy people ask me all the time and like, man, you know, you know, when are you going to retire or when, they, you know, is it still fun? Are you, I mean, I am learning more at every tournament I fish now than I ever have. I mean, it's just the learning curve is still, you just never, you're never going to, to get there. You never complete, you never finished, you never know at all. You never, it, you, and if you think you are, then you, you better quit because it's impossible. And like I said, it's, that's the thing. I love the competition and I love you said that a little bit ago. The people in the sport are what really, really makes it it special to this day. I mean, I've and I've been fortunate to really be close to a whole lot of really special people, you know, starting with Bob Cobb and Ray Scott in the beginning. Those guys really um, I think they saw what a, what it, uh, what it meant for for somebody, a young kid from the north to to get involved in the sport it, it was a it was a big spark for for BASS at the time and it was great for me too you know and they really em, embraced me and then over the years so many people there at, at bass and um you know around the industry too even even competitors you know i mean uh, i've had so many people from direct competitive companies other boat brands other motor companies other electronics companies say just man thanks for for what you do and how you do it, because you really helped all of us, um, you know, in, in driving this industry. And it's, it's what I have a passion for. So I love it, man. It's uh, I just feel so lucky to, to have had uh, the career that I've had and to, to met and known so many great people yourself included, you know, I might've helped you back in the day. Yeah, no, you've helped, you've helped me a lot. Um, <laughs> you've helped, I've, I've openly said many times without you and Zona, um, uh, there's no way I work for bass. I mean, and I, and I can never stop thanking for that. Was there ever a moment like along the way where you were like, Hey Zona, I think we really screwed up. <laughs> well, uh, we've done not about you, <laughs> so. But uh, Zona and I, we've had many conversations about things we'd wish we did different, but usually it's about a, a place we filmed a show or something like that. You yeah. know? But now it's, you know, in the end, there are a lot of things, a lot of things change, a lot of things happened. Um, you know, I've competed for a lot of years in a lot of different formats, uh, fish, you know, with, with BASS forever, then started Major League Fishing a long time ago. And and, um, you know, when the, the split happened with the Bass Pro Tour and that, I mean, it's a, that was a rough time for all of us and still is, you know, it's for, you know, for, for some people, but it's, it's, it's disappointing to me in how certain, certain people have handled it. But overall, um, you know, I think that uh, it's been really good. You know, I mean, competition is what drives innovation. For sure. I mean, why do you think that we have what we have going on in forward facing sonar right now? Is because of that competition between Garmin Lawrence and Humminbird, um, you know, and look at the quality of the products that we have. And the same with the tours, you know, I mean, the FLW tour, I don't think was near as big of a challenge for the fan base and uh, sponsor base as as what major league fishing, you know, you know, has become. And now that, you know, FLW is part of, of MLF and, and bass is there. I mean, there's obviously a lot of competition between the anglers, the sponsors and, and that, and um, it's, it's been, uh, it's been interesting. I think it's, it's given a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of anglers, especially opportunities that they wouldn't, wouldn't have had. And 
the technology is there now with the streaming that uh, obviously, you know, as much live bass fishing is on right now and as great as the, the ratings are for everybody, it's, you can't have too much. So it's, I think overall that's, that's been good. The, the toughest part about it has been some of the relationship things. It's, you know, it's been disappointing um, on some levels with, with some of that, but uh, you know, time, time seems to heal all wounds and, you know, I'm, it, it's a, it's very easy to look back at things and say, man, I wish this would have went differently, or I wish, you know, this, uh, I would have made this decision then or, or different, different things like that, for sure. Um, no doubt it's a, as a rough period for all the anglers, for the, for the leagues, for the industry, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a challenge, but in the end, um, it's created a lot of opportunities for a lot of people and it's created a great competition that I think a lot of the companies have benefited from. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, there's definite beneficiaries from it. And, um, I think you're right. Time heals all, you know what I mean? It, it's, it, but that in mind, Larry Nixon's back on the elite series. Is there a chance that we'll ever see Kevin Van Dam back at bass? Gosh, I, you, you, you you never know um, what would happen. I'd, I'd, I'd miss a lot of uh, the people there, especially, uh, you know, the, the group at JM, a lot of the, a lot of the camera guys and, you know, Wes and uh, Mike McKinnis. I, you know, was at the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame this year and, and uh, Mike and I had a really good conversation, you know, it, again, the people are what makes this, industry really special and it's it's really a, across the board but especially people that have been there for a long time because i've been there a long time i mean i think back to people like again uh ray scott and and bob cobb um you know it's great to see bob at the hall of fame this year but but even even other people that have just been around like you look at a jesse simpkins who i mean i worked with for plano with for 17 years and now he's on with saint croix but i mean he's one of the those guys that's been around forever uh, that a lot of people don't know in the industry, but if you're in the industry for a long time, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those type of people. And even again, like I said, people that are competitors or work for competitive companies that I've gotten to be friends with over the years, those are, that's what makes it, it real special to me. And what I, one of the things I love about our sport and our industry that I think is very different than you know, the NFL or Major League Baseball or any, any other, you know, leagues or sports or even, you know, NASCAR has a, a community like that, too. You know, I mean, I can tell you this, um, you know, fishermen as a whole are just really good people. You know, I yeah. mean, um, if if I'm driving down the highway and I got a flat tire uh, and one of these Elite Series guys comes by and sees me or something like that, they're going to pull over and help me the same as I, you know, would or say, Hey, they're at an event and you know, they, you know, they got a broken depth finder or trolling motor and I've got a spare, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to help them out or let them use your boat or whatever, whatever it takes. I mean, there's a fraternity there amongst us that uh, is pretty good, especially like I say, in the older group, there's a, I mean, there's so many new anglers now that, that I just don't even know. That's the thing. That's, that's one of the striking things to me is, these young kids coming up, um, you know, I watched the beginning of college fishing and now to watch the boom in collegiate angler, anglers and, and all of that, uh, you know, expanding, you know, you look at the Lee brothers, they were the beginning of that. And now look, I mean, they're, they're veterans uh, on tour. So it's, it's pretty interesting to see that. But a lot of these young kids now that are, that are coming up on the elite series, and that are coming into the uh, Bass Pro Tour, it's like, I never heard of this kid before. And, you know, you look at Patrick Walters, you know, I mean, look at uh, you know, all these uh, kids that come right out the gate and, and do real well. The, uh, you know, Brandon Polinick is a, is a you know, he's, he's not a good kid anymore, right? I mean, he, he's not, a, he's not the, that young guy anymore. Yeah. Uh, Ike and Ellie, look at him, dude. He acts like he's a kid, but but uh i mean he's been he's been doing this what well, i don't remember what year he won the classic in new orleans but it was uh, 2003 you know, 2003 yeah so i mean man he's 20 
20 plus years out there now. I mean, yeah. you look at Swindle's one of the, the oldest guys on the elite series now, you know, I mean, as far as number of years competing in that. And I remember, you know, I, I drew him in one of the, in one of his first tournaments, you know? So it's just like, man, it just, it goes by quick. People talk. So you're saying that you might be back one day. You never know. You never, I never rule anything out. All right. We'll cut all of that out and you'll answer just with that. No. Okay. Not- yeah. <laughs> KVD is um, coming back to the elite series. <laughs> it's going to be a title for the podcast. Yeah, um, you know, a lot of people talk about <clears throat> how you, how intimidating you are to compete against. And, and I'll be honest, like when I first joined the elite series as the MC, I was, I had seen it from the outside, but to really just see the, the, you had such a mental advantage over a lot of anglers for a long period of time, but you intimidate a lot of people growing up or or in the elite series, just through what you've accomplished, who intimidated you the most when you first started fishing top level tournaments? Well, um, early on, I was intimidated by all, you know, all those guys, but again, that first tournament, that lesson that I learned with, you know, drawn out with Ron Shearer, who, which at the time he was a big name pro, that was, that was a lesson that I learned. It's like, Hey, Larry Nixon, he's, he's out there, you know, with the, in the same body of water, making the same cast as, as me and Rick Klon, um, you know, all those guys. I mean, I, when I first started fishing, you know, Jimmy and Roland, um, you know, Rick, Hank Parker just retired. He won the classic and the James river and retired. So I'd never got to compete against him, but Hank and I have been, um, good friends for my whole career. You know, I mean, he was one of those guys I really looked up to. Um, Guido Hibden was very intimidating. It really, more importantly, Stella, his wife was really intimidating, (laughs) you you know, um, they're just very different. Denny, Denny was very intimidating to me until I got to, got to know him. Uh, But that's something as an angler, you better get over real fast. You know, and you're right. I I never really tried to, but it was interesting to see that. I mean, um, early on, Aaron Martins was was that way. I mean, I could tell by the way he acted towards me that it just I didn't have to do anything. Um, Crete was Crete was probably the guy that was the funnest for me to to mess with. And I mean, we're great, great buddies. But for for a while, I know that I was very intimidating to him and I didn't even have to try. But it was fun to, you know even pour gas on that fire a little bit, you know? So, uh, I, I just, I have a ton of great friends out there for sure. And, uh, I just, it's interesting to me to hear stories from other people what, that, that tell you things like that and about a situation or a time on the water. And I, I didn't, but I mean, I, I'll promise you this is I've always, um, you know, my whole career, People say whatever they want to say, but I mean, I have always fished my own way, my own style. I don't get help from people. I don't get information. I don't, I just don't fish like other people. It just, it just, it just don't work. And, um, you know, Davey and Scott were longtime roommates of mine. They they can attest to that. I mean, you know, but still to this day, people think, oh, Kevin, he won at Kentucky Lake because he got all, he's got all this help from people or he did all the, you, you don't, you can't. There's no consistency in that, you know. I mean, I've yeah. watched a lot of anglers over the years that did get a lot of help uh, all the time, and you know who they are as well. And you just, boy, if they get good information, they're they're doing good. But they just rely on it so heavily that it 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 would bite them, you know. The you know, and I was a big advocate of the no information rule. That's that got that definitely was pushed by uh, my era, you know, and and I was a leader in that where hey, we you know, these off limits and no information. I mean, today we're fishing uh, on the Bass Pro Tour under the strictest no information rules that there's ever been. And, um, you know, I'm sure people are still, I mean, I'm sure people are still trying to get around it for sure. And maybe if you are, but overall, I mean, that's all I've ever wanted is to compete against a, a level playing field, you know, when it, when it comes to that. Obviously, if you go to Florida and it's a mat flipping bite, you know, guys like Bobby Lane are are going to, you know, they're going to shine for sure because that's their background. I mean, um, and if you do a northern smallmouth event, 
man, I, I, I understand smallmouth, you know I mean? You guys are going to have an advantage, but you know, just getting waypoints and, and things like that. And that's what, that's, what's a little bit frustrating to me about this new generation that's coming up is, you know, a lot of high school and college anglers are just like, Hey, we got to go here. And I mean, I get calls and stuff from people all the time wanting, want me to give them the waypoints right where to go. And, you know, the cast angle. And I'm like, no, I just, that's not how you, that's not how you learn. And the, the good anglers that, that come up and that are consistent, they're not going that route. You know, you, there's, you, there's no consistency in fishing other people's fish. The mental side of the sport, which we've talked about, do, did you ever, you, like you said, it was a little fun with Crete and stuff like that, but I, I feel like dude, there was years there when, when I would interview anglers at takeoff in the morning and every one of them would say whatever they had for breakfast, whatever they had. And there was times where you, you I mean, and you could intimidate people without saying very much. Well, you know, they better catch them today because I know I'm going to stuff like that. <laughs> was when you hear documentaries like, you know, The Last Dance with Jordan, he talks about how much that mental side of things he used to motivate himself. Was that ever a thing with you? Uh, you know, I, I've always had a lot of confidence. And, and the one thing that I think that I've always been really good at is truly understanding what um potential my patterns or that you know where I was at in a tournament I mean you fishing a, a three or four day event is much different than a one day event and you have to plan for the future you have to fish for the future you have to practice for the future and you look at the weather forecast and all those things and and I always had a really good understanding of you know when I was fishing something that was going away or if I was fishing something that was coming to me and it just gives you a, a lot of confidence and in in some of those situations and i'm not i wasn't scared to uh, to to speak you know what i what i thought what i felt in my head and yeah it, it, it is you know i mean there's part of it that uh, i'm sure there's some gamesmanship to it I, I wouldn't say that it was that i always that i just did it intentionally but um and and you can't always back it up but in a lot of cases you know i did you know there's a Kid Rock song about that ain't cocky and <laughs> let you back it up. So, um, you know, yeah, I, I, uh, I, no doubt that uh, I'm, I'm, I was fully aware in a lot of situations what was going on there. Your style of fishing, everybody talks about speed, and many, many people have adopted that, and you've seen it go through different. Was that, I mean, I, I believe that's something you brought to the sport. You, I mean, you took, like, there's fast anglers, but did I fished a pond with you and can't keep up? Like, you never stop moving. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, was that just something always that the way you fished or, or was that something you designed or developed over years on tour? Um, it's a combination. You know, it's my DNA for sure. I'm pretty, um, you know, probably should have been on Ritalin as a kid. And, you know, uh, my wife still says I'm ADD and maybe HD, a little <laughs> extra still. And, but it, it is, you know, with, when you're competing in these multi-day events, you know, I, I learned real quick on that, that style is going to suit you much better to be able to find enough fish, have enough patterns, learn enough about the lake to have options for a four-day event. And a lot of people, I don't think, just had that mentality or, or, or made that transition, but I learned that real early on. And it, it really suited me that, again, that's why I had such a level of consistency, I think, right when I started is, is I always had options and something to fall back on. I, you know, if conditions changed or we got a, a big front that came in. Um, I had seen an area that I knew I could go to and, and get some bites. You know, it's it's truly knowing yourself, knowing your strengths, um, and knowing your weaknesses. You know, I mean, over the years I've worked on that. And when I really um became real dangerous in my career is when I was able to really blend the two together to know when you got a power fish, cover water, fish fast, and then when you slow down and and pound it out and milk a spot uh, and you know. And how to manage that too. I mean, especially um, once 
it got to the point where we really started having these big entourages on the water. I mean, you go to Kentucky Lake the first week of June and I was going to be a favorite. And I'm, you know, at the, at the takeoff the first day, I've got 50 people following me, you know, before I've ever even made a cast, you know, and to manage that because you're never going to get to fit. I mean, they're Gunnersville, Kentucky Lake, two of the worst places, you know, for that, you're never going to get to fish a spot twice. So being sneaky and, um, Gosh, one tournament there. I started out the day, and, it, and Bobby Lane ended up winning that tournament that year. Um, but I started that tournament with coming out of Paris Landing and had, I don't know, 75 boats following me. And I'm like, I'm not going to go. I had, And I had five mega schools found, mega schools, like where you couldn't make a cast without catching big ones every throw. And I'm like, I knew that if I could – you know, a couple of them might get found, but if I could, if I could fish one of those every day that I'd win the tournament, you know? And so I didn't even fish anything. I, I started running, just trying to lose these guys heading towards the dam running North. And at one o'clock, one thirty, and I got to be in at three something or three fifteen or whatever like that. Um, at one thirty, the lat I, the, finally the last boat and I was all the way down near the dam which is you know an hour away from takeoff and the last boat turned around and headed back i waited about 15 minutes and let those guys go and then i run all the way back down north stopped on a place my first cast um you know i i i hooked a great big one it looked like about a seven pounder it jumped off on a 6xd the plug hit the water and another seven pounder ate it and then i mean i had 27 or 28 pounds in seven casts there and then rode into the weigh-in and you know bobby even had more that first day but i mean that's just what, what i you know how i had to compete i couldn't even fish anything that i wanted to fish until the very end because you know once once you do that once you you'll never get i mean those spots like that that i've worked so hard to find you'll never catch them on it again never fish them again the bottom yeah. don't change the great lakes kentucky lake the bottom doesn't change. And, uh, it's, that's the, that's the sad part about, um, when you, when a big tournament comes to town, is it, it it's definitely tough on some of those fisheries. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, I, and I always think like it, I don't know how many more you could have won if, if simply just spot lock and live was invented earlier, because I mean, live has definitely helped reduce the flotillas like you don't see the hundred boat outside of the you know championships the classic and stuff like that but i mean the, you would literally to find you you were always the easiest person to find because you just look for literally a tournament blast off and when i think of like how you would manage that the spectators the camera person on the back deck of the boat a drone above you and you're still you know man and you're still trying to catch fish it's unbelievable what you know when i look back at i mean i think in some ways it's easier to win a tournament today just because of uh, just a few of those tools i mentioned yeah the um the last tournament that i won at toledo bend that was that was a zoo that one <laughs> you know i mean and i knew going in that i was going to have a good chance there because uh, the water was high um the fish were just starting to move out and nobody was fishing out and uh you know lake master mapping just hit on, I mean, they, they just mapped that lower end of that whole lake and the lake master mapping is just dumb, right? It's such a, one of the most valuable tools, um, that I've ever had in tournament fishing is lake master mapping. It's won a lot of, I've won a lot of tournaments directly because of it. So that one lined up like that, you know, the first day I caught a 20 pound bag on the shad spawn. And then I went out and called everything on my first offshore spot and, and had a, you know, really, and, and by 9.30 in the morning, I've got 25 or 26 pounds in the box and I get to practice the whole rest of the day with nobody watching me or anything. I caught an eight or nine pounder and ended up with a really big bag. And that's what it took, you know, to win that tournament is I had to have, you know, get a five pound lead right on the, on the first day. And cause coming down to the final day, it got, I ended up winning by a good bit, but I mean, um, it wasn't like I was getting a ton of bites after that because of you know, 75 to 100 boats chasing me around out there, you know, while while you're doing it. Uh, so I, I am so thankful for the popularity and that. But that that is one of those things that 
can be very frustrating out there on the water, you know, because 95% of those spectators are fantastic. It's the the couple here and there that, you know, want to steal your spots. Or I guess, you know, when you pull up at a place on Kentucky Lake and, and you you catch 15 in a row, they just can't help themselves. But to the second you leave to go in there and cast, you know, I mean, it's very interesting to hear some of the stories over the years after I leave a spot, what, what, you know, some of the people, you know, that stayed and watched how people are there, you know, it's just like, gosh, you know, it, it's cost me. Uh, the first time we fished Grand Lake, um, that Cliff Pace won, I had a pretty dang special deal and I caught a 20 pound bag off of it, you know, on a jerk bait. And after, after that we had left, I mean, these guys just throttled it with an Alabama rig and one of the, one of our officials that lives right there was in his house watching. And after we left, he's like, they, they stayed there till dark and they were there before you got there the next morning and then left before, because they knew when you're going to show up, you know, and I just can't, it mentality just floors me, but um, overall, man, uh, it's, it's, I've had just so many special moments. People, yeah. people say, well, man, what's your best win or what's your favorite memory out there, man? I've just, I've had so, so many of them. It's uh it's pretty awesome. You know, when it all comes together, you, uh, there's nothing like it. That, that Toledo Bend win, the win that many predicted would never happen. I mean, I, I have had, I had accomplished tournament anglers look at me straight in the eye and be like, yeah, Kevin's never going to win again. Did you change like what, what, how that, what was it like a five-year stretch where literally, I mean, the only hiccups in your career was that first one on thousand islands that you talked about. But other than that, I mean, you know, the, the difference between a good year and a bad year was whether you make the classic, whether you win angler of the year, whether you're competing, but you know, you were always up top. So one of the hardest things I would imagine is recovering after a dry spell, which you had never dealt with in your career. How, what was going through your mind during that time? You know, I never, um, I never let that bother me. And, you know, you have to have thick skin. It doesn't matter um, what sport you're in. I mean, you look at um, like, I'm a big NASCAR fan. And Jimmy Johnson was one of the nicest guys ever. He won seven uh, championships in NASCAR. And he's the nicest guy, raced people great, never. Did. And people hated him just because he won a lot. And that's, you know, to some degree, I, I, I had people that didn't care for me or still don't because of the success that I've had, which is, it's hard for me to, you know, to fathom. But there's people wanting, you know, pulling for me every tournament to not do good right and in my mind i i through that whole period it didn't it really didn't bother me because i still even though um i hadn't won i felt like i was good at you know, making good decisions you know you you get close you just have to have you have to have everything line up to win at the top level of this sport in any event whether it's a you know a three-day tournament like the classic i mean the classic should be one of the easiest tournaments to win compared to a four day elite series event or a Bass Pro Tour event or anything like that. But it's not because there's so much else that goes into it. And, you know, in my mind, I knew that I was doing all the right things. I, you know, it's not about my work ethic or how I practice or fish or I hadn't lost it mentally or whatever. It's just, you've got to have things come together. And uh, it's the same thing when I started on the Bass Pro Tour, I, the first couple of years, man, I didn't have uh, a, a win or anything like that, or even a, a lot of great finishes. But in my mind, I can look back and it's like, with that, when every fish counts, it's, you know, hey, you're one bite or two bites here at the cut line. And then, well, you make the championship round and anything can happen. So it's a tough format um, to to do well in. And, and it's the same, you know, over the years, I've competed in angler of the year and all the different points. You know, we had the E fifties back in the day, um, every format, every point system, every pounds and ounces, all, every style, uh, you know, catch way release for all of them to the Toyota, Texas bass classics to, uh, to all of them. And, you know, you got to just adapt for each, you know, you got to have a different strategy for any, any event you're in, you know, a three day 
tournament like the classic is way different than a four day elite series event, which is way different than a MLF cup, right? You have to have the, the right mindset for each one. And you just got to wait till things like, you know, till it all comes together. But if, you know, the process is not broke, my style, you know, my system is not broke. I have a system that I use to practice, to fish, to compete. And it's, it's, it's not duplicatable by many people because you just don't, you don't, we don't think the same. We don't fish the same. We don't work the same, but I know that, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty solid system. And when everything lines up correctly, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna come together. You know, that tournament there, um, was not a surprise for me to win. You know, once I, once I saw what I saw in practice, I knew I was going to have an opportunity to win that tournament. It's ones like, so the Cayuga tournament that I won, I think it was the same year later in the same year. I had no idea in that one. I did not expect to, you know, Jordan Lee started off um, that tournament in the lead. Um, I was, you know, solid every day. And that last day, none of us had a good day. And, you know, I, I just, I said, man, I, I blew it today. You know, I caught about a 15 pound bag and, and won the ter- ended up winning the tournament. Just saw, I don't know what happened that day, but nobody in the top ten caught him, and um, that one was a, was a shock. And so those ones are really really special when it's a surprise. You know, the the best moments are when you know you're going to win before it's going to happen. Um, the classic in New Orleans, um, you know, that final day there. I mean, I knew at ten o'clock that I had it in the bag, and your your whole family. You know, my wife. I just know how much she stresses about it. My whole family's there, my boys and everybody like that. They're all worried about it and not, you know, wondering what's going on in the water. And it just, that was a great afternoon for me to just soak in the moment and just know how special it was going to be just to my main goal. When I came through that Coliseum to the way in was to watch them, to see their, because, you know, you can't do it without a ton of family support. You can't do it without, um, you know, a great partner like I have with Sherry. And so to be able to deliver that and to, to see what it means to them after everything that they've been through and all the, the travel and the time away and all the sacrifices that your family has to make to, to live this sport. Those are, those are the moments that that's probably the most special moment uh, for me that I've had in my career was, was that watching my family that way in at that, at that time. Your career has been incredible, but I mean, your career's not done. What drives you now? I still, um, I love the competition without a doubt, but for sure, what's, what I love about this sport is, is still the people, man. It's, that's what, uh, I think is really unique. Um, I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of great friends out there. Um, I enjoy that, that camaraderie. I, you know, I, it's, it's different because there's a lot of new people I don't, don't know as well, but, you know, we just finished up. Um, we had a, a team series event in major league fishing and we did a draft for it and all that. It was pretty kind of a weird scenario, but I ended up, um, ended up fishing this with Todd Faircloth and David Walker. I mean, those are, I drafted both of these guys because that's at the time, based on what I thought, I was like, Hey, I know these guys and that, and I mean, we had so much fun through the process together yeah. and it's no different than um, when I get together with Zona or whatever, like our Whoville, uh, our annual Whoville hunt. That is just such a special week. Um, I never got to know Keith Combs like I know Keith Combs, and it's from our time down at Whoville and 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 Hank Cherry. I've I've watched Hank Cherry come up when he first started, and uh, you know his wife Jacqueline was there with us this year too, and just you know getting to it's that it's that time with 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 friends and you know Zona and I have gone so we go so far back, um, you know there's so many little things that that's what I love about that sport and the other thing to me is I would never get the opportunity to fish so many great places. Now we go to some stinkers every now and then you go to places that aren't aren't great, but 
Um, I get to fish the greatest places on the planet at some of the best times. And I would never have that opportunity. You just wouldn't do it if, if you weren't forced to by the tournament schedule. And, you know, the tournament schedule is a grind for sure. But it also is, you know, hey, how many times have, are you going to go to Toledo Bend in May or, or Santee and, um, you know, the first of April during the, the spawn? Or how many times am I going to go to the California Delta or Clear Lake? You know, I mean, to watch that tournament uh, where Steve Kennedy caught all those giant bass on those big swim baits. I mean, you look back at, at so many, I would never have gotten to go there. Amistad to Falcon Lake to Toho, you know, uh, Kissimmee Chain, Okeechobee, Potomac River, you know, Thousand Island, Champlain. I mean, we get to fish the greatest places there there are. And, uh, and still to this day, as much pressure as we're getting in that, it's still some of the best fishing we've ever seen. You know, I mean, fisheries are in, in great shape and it's, that's the part, that's what, what I get excited for. You know, I mean, each year um, you might get a little burned out, you know, at the end of the season, but man, come January, I'm re-energized and planning for the year and re-excited to, to go. And I've, again, 32 years of doing this. Um, you look at guys like Rick Klon, I mean, I don't think there's any way that that I'm going to go that long by any means, but uh, I, I still love it. You know, I, I definitely love the, the competition. I love the uh, the camaraderie. And I love, you know, I love the, the the people that are out there. It's just while we're talking, I just I got a message on my phone from Trip Weldon. You know, I mean, uh, Trip texted me and, and Gerald that um, that Harry Potts passed away, you know, and that's a sad text, but um, you know, Trip and I, Trip and I go way back, you know, to watch him get inducted in the hall of fame was, was pretty special. And that's, that's, what's, what's cool about our sport. And I think that's different than, than a lot of them. And it's the people that just like any, any great company, man, it's all about the people. Do you, do you think the people in fishing are so special because, uh, and I've always kind of, I've thought about it a lot because at, at times you think, well, maybe they just say that, you know, these guys are different. And I'm sure in every sport, they're like, well, our guys are different, but I truly see over and over again, how different, but I, my theory is it's because everyone got in it for the same reason. They just wanted to fish for a living. Like, you know, people have made a lot of money for as a professional angler. But that was never your goal when you started out. Your goal was just to be able to do it. Is is that what yeah. makes this group so special? Do you think? No doubt, uh, passion. You know, you you are not if you do not live it and have a passion for it, you are not going to be competitive. You are not going to make it on tour. And you know, I've had a lot of young uh, anglers come up to me and say, "Man, what what's what do I need to do, or what's uh, the thing?" Because I had a lot of people tell me when I started. Oh, you're never going to make it. It takes five years to even think about breaking into it. And, you know, sponsorship's tough and you just if coming from the North. It's not, uh, it's, it's not going to be an option. And I just never bought into any of that. I mean, if you believe in yourself and you put the work in, you can accomplish anything. And I see that in really almost every great angler, the young angler that come in. I mean, it's, it's work ethic. It's passion. If you don't live it, if you're not putting the time in on the water uh, to learn the techniques, to learn the electronics and things like that, you're you're going to get passed by. And and I've watched that with a lot of the anglers that get burned out and you know towards the end of their career. And, and I don't want to be that guy. I'm, and when I when I don't have that fire to to wake up at five and, and and get out there in the water and it's 33 degrees and raining and it's you know it's not going to be fun and tough and if i got to force myself to do that then man it's time to, to bang it up but uh as long as I'm and and that drive to go i you know why would you why would i this is what i do it's it's my life it's it's what i know so that's that's why i've, I've done it for as long as that, that i have i I don't do it for the trophies or the titles or the money or anything. I do it because I love it. Uh, and that shows through and always has. I mean, and I, I think you're right for whether it's a TV show, whether it's whatever, if you want to be part of this industry, if you don't love it, if you just like fishing and you think it's, it, it doesn't work. I mean, and, and I think that's when you hear groups of anglers talking and you're like, yeah, yeah, he's one of us. That's the weird 
trait yeah. that because you yeah. may never have fished with that angler blood, right? You know that's yeah. you can see it. You see, I mean, you you know as well. Um, you're around a lot of you get to interview a lot of anglers and um a lot of young guys coming in. You see um the new group every year coming in the elite series and pretty early on it's going to be pretty evident to who's going to make it and, and and who's not and and part of it is that right there i mean and you can still have you can have the work ethic and the motivation and still not for sure but um without it you definitely don't have a chance i mean it it definitely takes a deep drive and passion to be successful and that's that's probably true at about any any sport you know i mean you think about the training that a NFL player has got to go through. I mean, there's no, there's no three sport athletes in high school anymore. You know, there's just does. Yeah. And fishing is, is getting the same way. I mean, they're starting younger and they're, uh, there's so much more. I mean, uh, there's kids coming in now and they're in it. Just, I, I think it was different when I, when I started for sure. Uh, that it, I, I might've been very unique today everybody that's successful that's coming in is is doing all the right things and has put the time in and and has even though they're in their 20s they have years of experience seasoned veterans at at fishing maybe they they haven't been to california or other places but 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 where where they the region of the country they started from they're well versed even at a very young age this is a weird question but and maybe you just answered it but why you have you ever stopped to be like well I mean, I know you wanted to make a living fishing, but what you've accomplished, you know, eclipses anybody even close. Why you? Why did it happen for you? Shoot, I don't know. <laughs> That's a tough question. <laughs> Such a KVD answer. <laughs> I just, um, like I say, just all I've been doing is just doing what I love. And and I, I truly care about the... I, I I care about the sport. I care about the future. I care about the next generation. I care about the fisheries. Um, and and I'll tell you, from a conservation standpoint, and that I, I have learned so much um, from Johnny Morris. You know, he's the he is such a visionary when it comes to thinking and doing things that don't make sense financially, but are the right thing to do for the future. I mean, he's the greatest conservationist of our era by far since Teddy Roosevelt and to see the things, um, you know, he's a great friend of mine and to see the things that he's done and he's invested in um, to, to ensure the future of fishing, all species, different areas, but uh, you know, it, and to lead the charge and get people motivated. It's, it's it's pretty incredible and it's something that's very important to me and it, it's something that i know um i have a a platform to be able to carry on and those are the those are the things that that i'm thinking about going forward is what can i do to you know to help on a large scale for even even just get awareness uh to how important it is to have clean water how important it is to manage some of these fisheries uh, for aquatic vegetation, you know, I mean, how valuable a lot of these reservoirs are to um, these economies, you know, I mean, you know it, we live it, right? We, yeah. we see it, but the rest of the world doesn't think, doesn't necessarily think that way. I mean, it's, it's very, it's very interesting when you go to um, some of these, yeah, I don't want to even get, start politics or things like that, but it is, it's mind boggling to me, but when you grow up and, and live it and you see what it means to so many people and what it, what it can, uh, what it can do, the time outdoors, the time on the water, um, the, you know, the, with family spent together, it's, it's special and it's important. And it's something that we definitely have to protect and conserve going forward. And there's a lot of, a uh, lot of people that don't think that way for sure. So you know, all of that is, is important to me. And, you know, another thing that really uh, has shown me an area that I have a lot of passion for is, is l this past year um, I got elected to the, the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame board and the, the group of board members that they have and Bowman is uh, Steve Bowman is one of them. And 
Steve's, you know, obviously a great, um, you know, media guy, photographer, just got inducted into the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame himself, but he has a passion for the history of the sport. Um, and it, it bothers me that there's a lot of young kids out there, young anglers that don't know who Ray Scott was or what he meant yeah. to it, or Bob Cobb or Roland Martin or Jimmy Houston or, or whoever, you know, Steve Quinn, or, you know, I mean, a lot of these people. So, and through the, through that, it's, I've seen that. So the, you know, that's why that's another, it's another reason that um, I'm very passionate about trying to, to give back and, and, you know, the hall of fame is a special place there in the wonders of wildlife museum and to, to keep building that, to keep growing that so that, that history is preserved, you know, so that people know, because shoot, someday down the road, there's going to be people that, you know, look back at the early history and it's like, well, what about that Kev Van Dam guy? You know, those records are, that that's eons ago, that's meaningless or whatever. Well, it isn't. And that's not why I'm doing it, but it, it's just so important. Um, you know, I think in anything, history is where you came from is a big determiner of, of where you're going in the future. You know, they say history repeats itself. So it's important, I think, to preserve that and to, to learn from past mistakes um, on all levels and, and, you know, ensure that the future is bright for, for everybody, you know, so that we all got a place to send our grandkids and kids to have great fishing. Because then in the end, if we don't have you know, really good fishing. You know, we've got all these young anglers engaged and coming in. High school fishing's growing, it's blowing up. But if they're not catching anything and there's no fish in the lakes, no more bass, it, it's it's that's not good for you know for anybody. And that's that's why uh, that's why I've got a passion for conservation. Who's on your and there's no right or wrong answer for this? Who's on your Mount Rushmore for bass fishing for tournament angling? As far as a, from a comp as a competitive standpoint, wherever if we have to put a Mount Rushmore up for the people, not just competitors, but I mean Ray Scott's obviously on it has to be oh, on, and I would yeah, assume no, no doubt. Um, you know, from an as an angler, you have to really look at you know you you look at anglers, and there's no doubt that Rick Klon is uh, is there, uh, Larry Nixon is there, um, you know Danny Danny Prowers there. For sure, you know. I mean, you look at their uh, stats, and it, it, you, you just can't, you can't get away from those guys. And I just think Rick, especially in the era that he, he was, and you know, people are like, "Oh man, hear it all the time." Greatest, who's the greatest angler of all the time? There was a ESPN did a debate on it, and Klon and and Klon won it. But it's very easy. It's like, hey, you can you can look at current stuff or you can go back and, and look at past and how do you compare a baseball player from the 50s to to now you just it's just way different so but it's fun right but I mean those are the guys that I that I really um, look up to that really persevered through a lot of different years you know I mean I know some there's some anglers that had a great four or five year run um, but you look at the body of work and how do you, how do you not, you know, put Rick Klun at the, at the Mount, on the top of the Mount Rushmore, you know, and, and Larry or, and Danny as well, you know, it's just, uh, maybe someday, you know, I'll, I'll be there as well, you know, but I just don't, I don't look at myself the same as that. Those are guys that, you know, I grew up watching and, it's a, it's a shame that, um, you know, the, we didn't have that kind of coverage back then because it would have been, I'd have been way all in it early. I mean, to have the kind of coverage we have today. So it's pretty, it, this is, I say I got to compete in the greatest era of bass fishing. Well, I, right now, currently, I think is, is pretty darn special just because all of the technology um, and, and how visible everything is. I mean, for young anglers and or people to learn to get into the sport um it, there's never been a better time because you you can't can't miss anything why would you want to go out there in the water and follow anybody when you can just watch the live coverage and 
see four different anglers at one time and and be in, you're in their boat you know it's 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 amazing was that hard to adjust to you know when live first came out it wasn't like they said hey we're going to do a little live it was i remember like hey i was there the Bassmaster the, i was classic. on the set at the classic the first day that lot and i was like i knew that was world changing that moment yeah. i when we, when i was sitting there watching that at lake hartwell the um it, I knew that was world changing and it, it, the, the hardest part was, you know, you've always, I've always been able to keep certain things um, kind of to myself. Yeah. So like fishing a jerk bait through all seasons of the year was something that I, I mean, did I dominate tournaments with it, but man, it was just such a big part of, of what I did and live gave that secret away, you know, and now there, show me a, show me an angler, especially with um, with Mega Live and forward facing sonar, that's not an excellent jerkbait fisherman. Three sixty five, yeah, you have to be, you know. And it wasn't that many years ago that people didn't throw jerk baits other than in the spring, or you know, pre spawn winter. You know, now it's a it's a year round tool, and you know other little things. You know, uh, hair jigs on you know ledge tournaments or uh, big swim baits or, you know, I mean, it's, uh, Nico rigging or whatever, whatever little tricky thing that you have it as, you know, your strength, you can't hide it anymore. You can't, I mean, there's no, there's, there's no missing anything. And that's the, the great thing and the bad thing about live coverage. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, have no you, secrets. It, what stands out to you as things that you've seen on, on different live coverage and been like, I need to do more of that? Um, well, it's the thing that blows me away more than anything is watching how some of these guys think and fish. And I just can't do it. Like some of these Japanese anglers now, I can't fish a, a cast that's 10 minutes long. I can't fish a cast that's 30 seconds long, you know. Um, the mentality of of some guys that are that are good at some of these finesse techniques and things like that i just it's not in my dna um i just i just can't do it but what i do see is the little things like watching exactly how a guy's turning the handle on his reel wine and a crank bait or or a, you know a swim bait or spinner bait or whatever whatever it is you know seeing those subtle things that Hey, it's not just casting a red eye shad out there and reeling it in, right? You watch how somebody actually fishes that bait that's really good at any technique, whether it's, you know, uh, glide baiting or whatever. So like this past year, um, Carl Jacobson, right? He's, a, he's, a, he's a Minn Kota Humminbird teammate. Um, we got to shoot some uh, Mega Live stuff together. We I was right down there in his backyard and went to his house actually to rig, uh, you know, target lock on, on my boat. It was a secret at the time. And I got to spend a little time with Carl out there on chick. And I, I know that's his thing. And just to see the detail that he goes into it. And it's not just him. I mean, him and Brandon share a lot of information together, but and exactly how you rig the bait, you know, I mean, that Arashi's uh, glide bait that he throws, the difference of it out of the package to the way that he fishes it and then the rod the reel the line um how you book position the boat what you know what you're doing with it to 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 watch that and then you know to to be able to talk to him about it or you know for him to break it down it's it's pretty dang it's pretty dang cool you know i mean it, it, the same thing would be said if if i wanted to and you know i think i'm a pretty dang good crankbait guy for for ledge fishing there's so much more to it than um just casting it out there and winding it in right it's positioning it's it's uh it's retrieve it's color it's uh, your setup your line size your hook everything there's so many little things to it that um you know maybe someday i'll break them down you never know competition what is your focus level when you're competing um like I'm in really, percentage wise, like throughout the day, you leave takeoff. Where where are you? Like in uh, your head? I'm pretty in, I'm pretty intense. You know, I mean, 
some guys um, are not very talkative with their official or their. So for me, when I when I have my official in in the boat, he's like he's like my partner, right? And it's my thing is I talk through things. That's how I, um, I don't keep myself or keep answering my own questions is I like to talk through it. I explain to him what's, you know, what's going on. That's how I, how I do it. But I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty intense. I, so I share a lot with, with my official that nobody else would know. And, and I'm different than when I have a camera in the boat too. Like I know knowingly that you don't want to give too much up. And I've, I'm thinking about what's in the background and what they're seeing and, and that how I position an area just for that because you got a four a four day event. But um no, my intensity level's pretty I I'm I'm pretty serious. And to be honest with you, um on the Bass Pro Tour where we're scoring every fish that counts, there's no you can't catch five, you can't have 25 pounds in the box and 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 say and just relax there's never yeah. relaxing it's it's super intense um you know i think this year i mean we're switching i mean out the guy the 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 anglers voted to go for five fish and i and i get it i the rest of the world competes in a five fish format the rest of the league all the series is due but i love the intensity of scoring every you know fish especially when once we went to the two pound minimum or you know the uh, instead of 12 incher, you don't want to score. I don't think it's anybody's interested in seeing one pounders at a place that's got a 15 inch size limit on it. Right. Um, but when you're catching, when you go to a place like fork and we're fishing a two pound minimum and every fish counts, it's dang intense there because you can pull up, as you know, to any spot there and, and, you know, catch 75 pounds in, in a few minutes. Yeah. And so that that leads to, and that's the way it was. We had extreme conditions at our event there this year. Man, I was doing good for a while, and it's um, you just believe at any moment. So it's stressful. I can tell you, I I sleep real well at night after, on tournaments. So do I take it that you voted to stay for every fish? Was that your? Yeah. Opinion? Yep. Yep. I just I think that, uh, and it wasn't even close. Um, but there was a handful of people that really, really wanted. Um, and, and I see both sides. I think yeah. for, for me personally, um, it'll be better. You know, I, I think, you know, I do better in a, that's I, my whole career. I've yeah. been, I've fished for five, right? And, and you want to target big fish. It'll change things immensely because, you know, nobody, nobody wants to go to Redcrest at, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, at Lake Norman, and see somebody put forty-one pound eight ounces on the school. They want to see how you're going to go there and target the, the the minimum part of the population, which is the biggest fish there, to try to catch a fifteen-plus pound bag a day. You know, so you're going to see instead of everybody just going around live uh, live sonar fishing for schoolers to throwing jigs around docks and glide baits around the shore and uh, bigger baits and, you know, looking for five big ones, you know? So, and I, and that's, that's, again, that's what tournament fishing started as. So I, it's probably, you know, it's, even though I like the other format, it's, it's the right choice. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it was voted on. I, I was shocked to be honest. Like I, I, as a fan of the sport, I thought the every fish counts, it, it's different. At least, you know what I mean? Like everything doesn't need to be the same, but um, I'm sure it'll work out pretty good for you. Um, I got one more question for you. It's not even my question. I stole it from my buddy, Chris Van Vliet, who has a much more successful podcast than I could ever dream of. But I think it's a great question and I love asking it and I have to give him credit. What is the greatest advice you've ever been given in your life? The greatest advice I've ever been given. Well, never let anybody tell you what you can or can't accomplish. Don't, you know what I mean? Don't, it, it wasn't in a one sentence thing like that, but it's yeah. again, 
And I've said this many times, if you believe in yourself, you, you can, you can do anything. And I'm a perfect example of that is that nobody told me or everybody told me when I first started out that you, you, you're from the wrong area. You're too young. You, you know, it's, it's going to take a while for you to be successful. But I, in my mind, I, I believe that I could compete. After I fished my very first BASS tournament and saw how the guys went about it and how they did it and experienced it, I knew in my heart I could do it. And even though I had a lot of people telling me not to, and that's something, you know, I've always said in the back of my truck, you see it's, it's all about attitude. And that's, a, you know, one of my sayings, um, if you got a positive attitude, good things are going to happen. If you got a bad attitude, good things generally don't happen. So attitude is everything. And, and if you believe, you know, it, it may not, it may not work out every time, but if you believe it, anything could happen. Well, I think you've definitely believed it and you have definitely achieved it. Now, more importantly, how about your red hot Detroit lions? Do you believe? Oh my God. I, it's, it's, it was the beginning of the season was really disappointing. You know, I mean, obviously, um, yeah, I, I, I think that he has that team believing and it, it just shows you the power of that, right? Yeah. The power of attitude and, and the teamwork and everybody together that it's, um, it's pretty dang, it's pretty dang special. So watch what they've done the last four weeks. Uh, you know, really even Thanksgiving day, it, it was, uh, it was incredible. You know, I mean, they lost to the bills and, you know, Don Barone and I were, we were texting back and forth. He's a huge bills fan. I'm a lions fan. They've had a lot more success over the years. I haven't, but they lost that game. Uh, but, and they shouldn't have, I mean, I think that Dan Campbell cost them that game and some of those decisions, but and early in the year, they, you know, I didn't agree, but I mean, I like that the fire and the energy and you can see there it's a culture and there's a big turnaround there. And it, as a, as a lifelong lions fan, I'm pretty excited. It's been, it's been a lot of fun to watch and um, I'm a much bigger lions fan nowadays than I am a bills fan. Just, and I actually love the bills. <laughs> That's what sucks. Like I live closer to the bills than anything, but being such a chiefs fan, I kind of have to hate the, the bills but if they i mean if the bills don't beat the chiefs this year they're never going to beat them is my yeah. take on it because i mean they've literally spent i mean other than the bad luck with von miller i mean they have bought they've got all of the every piece that i see available and i'm like chiefs get it the bills grab it i mean it was yeah. kind of like the the rams last year i mean yeah, the, the same I, same stereo same thought process they know their window and i think yeah. they're they're and josh allen is amazing quarterback he's i I I like him better than Patrick Mahomes. I'll be honest with you. Well, I mean, a lot of people don't like Patrick Mahomes, and uh, that's fine. That's yeah. You know, a lot of people didn't like Tom Brady throughout nope. his career either. And uh, you, <laughs> why, did, why, why do you is, like why do you like Josh better than Mahomes? Um, I like Patrick Mahomes. I think he's the smartest, fastest thinking quarterback that I've probably ever seen in the league. Um, he's very athletic. He can make things happen. He, you know, he's a game changer. He's definitely uh, the Mount Rushmore of, of the quarterbacks that are out there. I just like, I think Josh Allen's has that he, he's super smart as well, but he's, he's physically a, a bigger, more durable. I mean, it, and I should clarify that if I wanted to say, Hey, I want to pick my quarterback for the next 10 years for the lions. I just feel like his shelf life, um, is going to be there. Patrick scares me when he's running around. If he gets one really bad hit, you know, because we've seen it. I mean, Matt Stafford, you know what a Stafford yeah. fan was forever uh, with the Lions, still am. And man, he just always had a tough time with his line. And, you know, I mean, he, he missed a couple of seasons with injuries. He had a lot of injuries and he's tough, been sacked a lot and that, but you lose that guy. And where's your team? You lose Patrick Mahomes and you're done. You lose the Bills, lose Josh Allen. It's over. You know, I mean, some of these other teams, you know, look, look at the Rams the year before you, they, all they needed was Stafford. I mean, and not, he, 
he's he's a he's a really good quarterback but I mean you just can't in, insert anybody in that position and as good as the Chiefs are and the Bills are in other areas those two guys are the reason that they're yeah the top teams in the NFL yeah um and and dude like you said earlier you consider yourself lucky to have been part of the sport to come along at a time when it was just been nothing but upward trajectory. I think we're really lucky as, as football fans, if you love football, I mean, I remember Peyton left and I mean, we all thought Brady was going to leave eventually, (laughs) Um, but he hasn't, but, but there was like a void, you know what I mean? There's something special when, when Brady plays, Peyton, you know what I mean? When Brady plays Aaron Rodgers, like when you see those and, and it's awesome to look at Burrow, uh, Josh yeah. Allen, there's so many incredible Herbert. There's so many incredible quarterbacks. And um, I, I think we'll have lots to argue about for many years to come. <laughs> it's going to be an interesting uh, postseason for sure. It sure is. Kevin Van Dam. I'm sorry. This was so long, but dude, I get, Listening to somebody, I mean, I appreciate your openness and honesty. And um, I mean, I'm going to talk to you more in the future here, but have a Merry Christmas. You bet, buddy. Happy holidays, everybody. Well, I promised a very real, raw, and honest Kevin Van Dam. And I may be biased, but I'd say KVD delivered once again. Um What a great conversation and almost a bit of a therapeutic conversation, you know, because obviously the last four or five years has been a weird time for people in the industry. I mean, it's good things for podcasts to throw around a lot of dirt and get some traffic, but it's, it's people's lives. And, and, um, I enjoyed hearing some of the stuff that Kevin talked about. I think he talked about stuff that I haven't heard him talk about uh, ever in the past. Um, And it was another long one. So I thank you for sticking through it. And with that in mind, I mean, every once in a while, there'll be podcast experts that you hear and they'll say, if your podcast is below 55 minutes, you're going to get more clicks and plays. From the beginning, I promised one thing with this show. It's going to be a real conversation, as close to a real conversation as my guests will allow. And I'm thankful for each and every one of them that comes on here. And sometimes it's 45 minutes. Sometimes it's two and a half hours like it was last week. But as long as we're having a great conversation, I'm never going to stop someone just because I might get a few more clicks if it's shorter. It's, it's a conversation. Some of them are short. Some of them are long. But I hope they're all rewarding. You know, I hope they're all intriguing, and I hope that this show delivers one thing, a real raw and honest, I mean, I guess that's more than one thing, a bunch of things, but I hope you get to see a little bit more of who the people are outside of their initials. Like, it's easy to be KVD and and see, you know, him as an image, but he's a person. And if you look at, like, the last number of years, people in this industry, it's been weird. You know, it's there's been like, you look at all the relationships and stuff. It hasn't been easy with the split, but um, I found this podcast to be honest and frank. I mean, it was kind of therapeutic. I mean, it was, it was, I enjoyed it anyways, but it doesn't really matter if I enjoyed it. it matters if you guys enjoy it. And with that in mind, here's the question of the week. How long should a podcast be? I mean, do you want me to just keep, wheeling them the way we do and let it go as long as it goes or do you want them under 55 minutes do you want them under a half hour um let me know what what do you think the perfect length is should we just let it cruise and wherever the conversation goes goes or should we tighten it up and be more professional in 2023 which i mean i'll be honest i've been trying that since um well, yeah, since high school, and it really hasn't worked out. Professionalism is not um, um, my forte, let's say. But I am thankful for every guest that comes on this show. I'm thankful for their honesty. I'm thankful for their openness. And I'm thankful for each and every one of you that chooses to tune in to the number one rated podcast on this particular channel. And the best part is, we'll be back next week with another one. Until then. Enjoy being, have a good week, and Bob Cop, take it away. 
Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?